I'm at Brunel University in Uxbridge to visit my old stomping ground because it's here that I spent almost eight years at university doing my undergrad in mechanical engineering and then I went on to do my engineering doctorate, an EngD, in computational fluid dynamics. This is my thesis and the person that's here that I really want to visit is Professor Maria Colacatroni. She supervised this research and she's a bit of a superstar in the world of building services engineering. The Department of Mechanical Engineering, where I spent almost eight years of my life. About to enter Professor Maria Colacatroni's office. Maria supervised my doctorate. She was a doctor then. Um, she helped me become a doctor. And this is not the office that I spent a lot of time in. It's brand new, apparently much bigger and much more kind of, I don't know. She's gone up in the world. 20 years almost. It has been 20 years really, yes, Look, since. I have it here. And I'm actually, yeah. I have it there as well. A lot of time has passed and I would love to know how this research has contributed to the advancement of this topic. Have things changed in 20 years? Actually, as an example, yesterday I received notification of a paper that some researchers published in this September, September 2023, 20, that had a citation on the paper that oh. you published. Oh, you really? know about yes. You were such a fundamental part of putting this thesis together because you were essentially supervising me, making sure that I was doing things the right way. First of all, it was an NGD rather yes. than a PhD. Yes, yes. And they're radically different, aren't they? Different, but they both need to make a contribution to knowledge. So that's what they have in common, and this is what a doctorate is about. But in the case of NGD, this contribution to knowledge needs to be of relevance to the industry as well. That's exactly why I chose to do an NGD rather than a PhD because I was really wanting to be in industry. As an engineer, it's so much more important to be practical and get that industrial experience. As a female engineer, you know, you were really leading the way in building services engineering. You know, building services engineering is a branch of mechanical engineering. It's a branch of mechanical engineering. And of course, because it deals with buildings, then it has got quite a lot of physics in it and it has got quite a lot of architecture in it. At the time, 20 years ago, technology, hardware, computers could only take the equivalent of a photo of how the air is behaving in the space. And that's, it's useful, but what's way more useful is seeing how air flows change with time. What happens if we open a window? If someone walks through a door? How do the air flows change? But the technology wasn't there at the time. The computational power was not there or it was very, very expensive, yes. Yeah. Times have changed now. Yeah. We have the computational power to be able to do all those mathematical equations that change with time. 20 years ago, we were working out how to do that, going from static to dynamic. So that's the second major problem, is that air behaves much more quickly mm -hmm. compared to how a wall responds to changes in the environment, essentially. Yes, yeah. What were we tackling back then? Was it ambitious? It was, and still is, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you developed this uh, freeze flow technique that then you stopped what is happening in one medium and you continue the, the simulation, you know. Yeah. So we're going to be walking around campus. We're going to be looking at various different buildings and the building services engineering aspects of those buildings. But also it's going to be a real trip down memory lane. Maria and I did a tour of some key building services engineering features. First up, an atrium, which didn't even exist 20 years ago when I was a student here. It is a very nice uh, space that lets ventilation, lets air move around, and it is a classical space that it can be modelled with the results of your work. Considering it's an atrium and it's a really sunny day, it does not feel hot in this space like you would in a greenhouse. The reason why a space like this is interesting for the research that I was doing is because um, usually a lot of the buildings that we occupy are extremely heavy. 
it's actually called heavy buildings because heavy they're building. made of brick and concrete and yeah, yeah. this really dense material. Dense Whereas weather. this kind of space is made of much lighter materials, which means that it's more responsive to how air changes because air changes quickly, heavy building materials change slowly. And my research was about resolving that change the in... The response of these two different kind of materials, yes. So just a bit of context. This is where I did all my undergrad lectures, where Maria gave some lectures as well as other some, yeah. lecturers. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait to see what's changed, but I was always the person in the front row, like a true keen bean. Ah. Lecture time, can't go in the studio. Just by contrast, we were in uh, atrium before. This kind of has an atrium structure. Yes, yes. But it's a much heavier building, because if you look at the materials, really heavy concrete. Yes, yes, yes. And it feels cold to the touch, which just goes to show that concrete just traps heat. The concrete is blue and shiny is hot in the face and then cold hot. and hot. <laughs> What happens if I stand near the glass? Let's have a look. Ah, similar image. But it is cold outside today and the lighter building material of glass is cold to the touch too. This thermal image may have been a bit different on a hotter day. Now on to another location on campus to look at an alternative to building insulation using the thermal imaging camera. We're about to go over a bridge that existed when I was studying here. I thought it was a really nice touch at Brunel University to have a little stream flowing through the campus. This bridge leads to the student halls where I stayed. This white board, actually what it is, it contains vacuum insulation panels. So it is insulation that it is much more insulating than the common insulation materials. And this is because they are creating a vacuum in the uh, middle. And it's keeping it warm? And it is keeping it warm, I hope. You can see it now. It is blue, cold, low cold because it doesn't allow uh, um, heat to escape for the building. While around it, the original construction is red or yellow, so more heat comes. So rather than carving into the wall itself and putting insulation, like foam insulation in there, you've stuck something to the side of the wall to keep the heat in, and it seems yes. to be working. Yes, yes. And how that relates to my research is that I was looking at the air flowing in the building. In the building, yeah. But how the air flows around the building envelope also has a massive effect on how the air flows inside the building. Inside the building because of the weather conditions. And now on to a third and final light building. Another delightful case study for any computational fluid dynamicist who simulates airflow in enclosed spaces. See, in what's space. interesting about a space like this from a fluid dynamics point of view is that we're only about two, two and a half metres high at most. So engineers have to make sure that two and a half metres up, the air is comfortable. What happens After. outside Afterwards, of yeah. that space doesn't matter. And it's actually expensive to worry about it because you don't want to be heating or cooling, cooling air yes. that we're not going to move through. Big, tall atrium spaces like this need fluid dynamics to really be able to see how the air is moving. There's going to be a lot of rising of hot air escaping out through these windows. It's basically a perfect project for any undergraduate student or even a PhD, right? It improves the quality of life and the building is more sustainable in the sense that it doesn't consume so much energy. From hot air rising to various different window openings and office spaces and social spaces and all of that needs to be simulated in order to design a building that is really energy efficient, making use of natural forces of yeah. Physics. Yeah. That marks the end of 36 videos in a series of engineers making a difference social media campaign where I filmed with loads of engineers from the book, engineers making a difference, but also engineers who are not in the book, who are really doing incredible things in the world of engineering. I hope you've enjoyed the films. It's been really amazing coming back to Brunel University and revisiting 
my research and finding out how it fits into the entire jigsaw puzzle of building services engineering. It was amazing to see Maria again. And just acknowledge the engineering work of not only the engineers that have been in the campaign, but the engineering that I've done in computational fluid dynamics. And to realize that in 20 years, um, we build on the work of engineers that have come before us. And engineering will always be about that. Problem solving, collaboration, and building on the knowledge we already have. And that is where all engineers truly make a difference.